Would you stand with me, please, as we um, turn to the Lord's Word, looking at the 16th chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 14. This is the word of the Lord. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And who who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Father, as we come to this word this morning, we acknowledge this is a, this is a difficult passage. It's difficult to interpret, to understand, and we just ask, Lord, that you will give us insight and understanding, clarity of thought today. Put away all the distractions that so easily uh, come upon us, even as we are here planning the week, figuring out what to do about this or that problem. Pray that somehow we'd be able to put those aside for a moment to listen to your voice. We acknowledge we need you desperately, Father. We are left to our own devices, terribly selfish and self-centered people. And we pray that you will show us how to become more like you, how to be those who are cooperating with allowing the will of God to be known on earth as it is in heaven how we pray for that as we pray for your kingdom to come. Bless us then in your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated and uh, please turn in Luke 16 if you're not already there. Our, uh, one of our granddaughters, Megan, um, I texted her last night, got a response even though she was in the middle of her prom out in California, which was a bit surprising. But um, she, it reminded me of a time when she was a little younger, when she was about two years old, maybe getting two, two and a half. We took her to a pumpkin patch one, one Halloween, and they had, uh, you know, the little typical, typical little circle of ponies that you could put a child on. And she since has become a pretty good horse rider, has done a lot of it, but she hadn't done any at that point in time. So this was her first try. So I put her up on the little pony, and then I stood there waiting for the pony to, for, for, the, for the group to start. And as soon as I did, I put my arm on her just in case she would fall or something while still staring straight ahead. As soon as my arm went around her, she said, Grandpa, don't touch me. Don't touch me, Grandpa. <laughs> Apparently, our desire to be self-sufficient runs very deep, right? And it starts very young. We love do-it-yourself. You can remodel your house. Lowe's can help, but you can do it, right? Patty and I re-roofed one of our homes that we lived in. Lowe's was absolutely no help, I can tell you that. <laughs> you can do your taxes. You can file for divorce online these days by yourself. So it's no wonder, I think, that billions of people try unsuccessfully to self-justify before God. It just comes natural to want to do something to help ourselves and to prove ourselves and to advance ourselves. I think this is true. It's an inherent quality in mankind. It's perhaps more true in America than anywhere else. We are a self-sufficient, self-centered, self-motivated people. And we have been taught that from our earliest times, but it's a doomed strategy. That's Jesus' message in this passage. It was always his warning to the Pharisees, as you've noticed time after time as we have gone through this Gospel of Luke, but he perhaps makes it no more clear than in the passage before us this morning. And he does it with kind of three hard-hitting points that he makes here. First one is the bankruptcy of self-justification. The bankruptcy of self-justification. The Pharisees were 
poster boys for the idea that you can somehow earn your way to God. Strategy that sends probably more people to hell than any other. The idea that my goodness is good enough, that I can make it on my own. This is what the Pharisees believed. This is what they taught. This is what they hammered away with. And as we come into this passage, they have just heard Jesus teaching about money. And they, who were lovers of money, heard these things, which basically went against what they were teaching, and they mocked Jesus, and they mocked his teaching. They're basically saying, what you're saying is not true. Money to them was, got at least equal billing with God, even though Jesus had just said you can't serve God in money. They thought money was a sign of the blessing of God, which it can be, but not necessarily is. It certainly cannot take an equal place with God, but that's what Jesus had been teaching and they took issue with that. And then Jesus responds with a scathing review of their self-justification. He knows their hearts. He knows what they're about and he knows that God the Father knows about this. And so in verse 15, he says, and you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. Jesus' point is this, I know you guys. I know what you do. I know you claim to be obeying the law of God, but I know how you do that. You reinterpret it. You reinvent it. You reimagine it in your own image and you create rules and regulations that you can keep that have nothing to do with the law of God. They're just a pretext. He said, I know what you do, but he said, I know you do that to please men, and I know this, that God sees your hearts. He knows who you are, and your loopholes, and your traditions are an abomination to him, and you need to know that. This verse illustrates the bankruptcy of self-justification in four ways. In trying to self-justify, they were playing to the wrong audience. They were using the wrong standard. They had the wrong focus, and that led them to have the wrong Savior. Four wrongs in this one verse. And believe me, four wrongs do not make a right. So let's look at their, where they went with this. First of all, the wrong audience. They claimed to be pleasing God. They claimed to want to know God, but Jesus knows better. He says, you are those who justify yourselves before men, wrong audience. They wanted the acclaim of men. They wanted to be thought righteous more than they wanted to actually be righteous. They liked it when people came around and revered them, but they had the wrong audience, beloved. They thought if they could just be pleasing before men, if they could be thought great before men, that's all it was gonna take. They didn't recognize that it wasn't going to be favorable friends who would one day judge them or even basically acquaintances who revered them, who had them on a pedestal. Somebody else would be judging them one day and they willfully forgot this. Turn to John chapter 5. It wasn't even, interestingly enough, it's not even God the Father who will be judging them. Look in John 5 and beginning in verse 22. And Jesus says this, he says, the Father judges no one. There's a surprise, is it? The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. He's given all judgment to the Son, that all who honor the Son, just as they honor the Father, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Jump down to verse 27. And he, the Father, has given him, Jesus, the Son, authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Who's the judge at the end of the day? The sinless Savior. Sinless Savior. Which means we're not going to be able to stand before God and say, but, but there was an extenuating circumstance here. Because the judge is going to be the one who went through every, according to the book of Hebrews, went through every temptation just like we are yet without sin. There are no excuses that will work on that day. And here is the one that they have mocked who will one day be their 
judge. They got the wrong audience when they were worrying about what other people thought. There's only one person who counted, and that was Jesus. And they were mocking him. Can you imagine what a day that's going to be when these people who have mocked him on earth stand before him in judgment? What a reversal of fortune. And when they are, because they are self-justifying, they will have no other advocate. They'll have no one to stand up for them. The books will be opened according to the book of Revelation and every word and every deed and every intention and every, uh, every uh, thought of their heart will be revealed, everything. And they will be judged and they will have nowhere to hide in that day. All the secrets are coming out of the closet. As Jesus has warned them before, and will we find that they far sh fall short of the glory of God. They fall far short of the glory of God on that day. Others may have thought them the finest person they ever knew. But when the intentions and the thoughts, and the motivations of their heart are revealed, they will be revealed to be the sinners that they are because that's the sinners that we all are. They were playing to the wrong audience. You know, in, in Matthew 6, verse 2, Jesus kind of humorously shows how foolish it is to look for man's approval. He says in Matthew 6, 2, he says, thus when you give your, when you give your money to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Did they, did they actually sound trumpets before themselves when they went to give their offerings? There's no historical validation that they did that. I think it's just another uh, exaggerated statement of Jesus speaking in hyperbole to note, well, they didn't actually send a trumpet ahead of them when they went into the temple to give their money. He was indicating that they did everything they could to make sure people knew they were coming. They went at just the time when the most people would be there. The, the reference to trumpets may be a reference to the fact that the places where they put the money when they gave it in the temple were shaped like little trumpets. And you know, you'd put your money in and it would collect at the bottom. They wanted people to know this is what they were doing. This was meaningful to them, that they looked good before men. They subscribed to a theory that, well, there's, there's a guy named Ogmundino. He's a, he's a modern... He's a modern writer. He's written books like The University of Success and The Greatest Salesman in the World. If you haven't read them, you haven't missed a whole lot. But one of the things that uh, Mandino says in one of his books, he says, let me define success. Success is getting people, other people to believe that you're successful. That describes the Pharisees to a T. That's what they were experts at. They were experts at getting other people to believe that they were wonderful, but perception may be reality here. But it means nothing when we come before our Lord and Savior. We better worry about what God sees rather than what other people think, right? So people pleasing, this natural bent that we have to want to be favored by other people, it's just a road that can lead to destruction if we're not careful. That's where it was taking the Pharisees. And so here they found themselves because of that philosophy, mocking the very one who would be their judge one day. They had the wrong audience. Secondly, they had the wrong standard. They had the wrong standard. Usually if you play to the wrong audience, you'll get the wrong standard. The one led to the other. Look at verse 15 again. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So what's the problem? The problem is their standard is what people think rather than what God thinks, right? Their problem is that they're trying to meet the standards of people rather than live to the perfect character of God. So they had the wrong standard. They could judge themselves okay because they were meeting the standard that they were following, which was the traditions that they and others had built up around the law. So the law, which would have condemned them because it was absolutely perfect and to describe the character of God to perfection was of no use to them because they weren't trying to do that anyway. They were trying to meet it by 
the definition that they had given it, by the bent rules that they had applied to it. And the standards of men will always be a moving target. If you've been alive long enough, and most of us here probably have because things in our culture have changed so quickly, you know that the standards have changed. They've changed in the last five years in our country. Tremendously changed. And if you want to go back 50 years, it doesn't look like the same culture because the rules have changed. The standards have changed. The standards of men's, what men think is right, have always changing. I was with Danny Thomas, you know, he was the old comedian one time. He said this, he said, when I was a kid, a film was considered obscene if the horse wasn't wearing a saddle. <laughs> we come a long way, baby, right? Long way from that. The more we follow men's standards, beloved, the further we are going to get from where God is. Just the way it works. An unchangeable God, a God who has no change, has different standards than we do. Let me illustrate it this way. There's, there's, a, there's a lady named Jane. She comes to visit her, her, her sister Sally, right? There's going to be a family reunion. So Jane comes to Sally's house one day, and the folks are going to come the next day. So Jane wakes up the next morning. She comes out of her bedroom because she's hearing all this whirring and all this noise and chaos going on there. And she finds Sally outside running the vacuum cleaner for the, all she's got. She's got the broom out ready to swim. She says, and, and, and as soon as Jane appears, she finds that she's got a dish, uh, dish rag. She's got a, uh, a dust rag in her hands. I'm not familiar with these rags, you see, so I, <laughs> I get them mixed up. She has a dust rag in her hand. Her city sister says, get busy. And Jane says, well, Sally, you just cleaned the house. I mean, when I came in yesterday, it was great. And Sally says, yeah, it's, it's, it's sister clean. By noon today, it's got to be mother clean. Now, some of you understand the difference there, right? I understand that difference. You know, Patty's gone for a few weeks like she was recently. I got a big job the night before she's coming home, right? Because her clean is not my clean. And beloved, our clean will never be God's clean. Uh uh. God's clean is perfection. If you play into the wrong audience by the wrong standard, you can't get where you need to get. Now, we can't get to God's clean on our own either. That's going to be the message before we get done. But I just want you to see the standard is way up here. And the whole point of Jesus mentioning this is so that we understand we can't meet that standard. So there has to be another solution. They had the wrong standard. Thirdly, they had the wrong focus. This is really critical. It's an obvious one. It's one we talk about at church a lot, but it's one that most of us don't pay much attention to most of the time. And most people really never think about this. Most people never think about this. Their focus was outward. God's focus is inward. See, our default setting is to think if I'm not, listen, how often have you heard this? It's not hurting anybody. Now, usually when you hear that, it is hurting someone. And we can make cases for that with regard to certain sins in our culture that have suddenly gone from, you know, abominations to completely tolerated. But the point is, that's not the issue. It's not an issue whether it's hurting anybody or not. It's, a, it's an issue of what do, you, what do you like inside? At the very least, the way we think and the motivations of our heart are killing us. Their focus was outward, not inward. That was their default setting. Jesus says, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your what? Hearts. Still think that, that 1 Samuel 16, 7 is one of the key verses in the Bible where God says, God looks on, men, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God knows what goes on in our hearts. And beloved, whatever, however good we may be outwardly, our heart will condemn us. They think they're good because they're in outward compliance, but they forgot God knows their hearts. They think they're good because they didn't kill anyone in the last week or in their lifetime. But Jesus says everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Matthew 5, 22. They thought burnt offerings would cover any indiscretion. 
Jesus said, first be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. They thought that they could love their friends but hate their enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Outward perfection, beloved, even if it were possible, which of course it's not, would never cut it. It wouldn't cover a rebellious heart. God sees right through the outward facade to the heart that's underneath. Their focus was all wrong. You know, I was, saw on television one time, they had this, this thing about Howard Carter. He was the man in 1922 who got to the tomb of King Tut inside one of the pyramids in Egypt. And they went in and they, they found, you know, most of those, most of those uh, tombs had been robbed long ago by robbers, but somehow there was this one that was still intact. And they broke through the seal of this tomb and got inside. And of course, the treasures that met their eyes were just phenomenal and unbelievable. And in the middle of it is this casket. So they open it up and inside there's another one that's, a, that's gold leafed. And they open that one up and there's another one that's gold leafed. And they open another one and it's pure gold. But inside that one, they found King Tut. And there he was, covered with a gold mask, covered with gold cloth, covering his body. But of course, when they took that off, what did they find inside? The shriveled, decayed, rotten to the core, leftovers of what had been King Tut. You can have, beloved, a masterpiece on the outside and still be rotten to the core inside. And these people had failed to see what Jesus needed them to see, what they needed to see if they were ever going to come to salvation, which was the rottenness on the inside because they were looking only to the outside. This led them, of course, to the fourth problem of those who would self-justify, they had the wrong Savior, who was their Savior. Verse 15, you are those who justify yourselves. Think you can save yourself? Most people think this is what the Bible teaches. It's simply because they haven't studied it and really understood what it's teaching. The Bible does want us to be good people. It does urge a moral existence, but it urges it on the basis of the fact that we have been saved, come to faith in Jesus Christ, so now we know how we should live as part of the family of God. It's a reaction to salvation. It's not a way to salvation. So misunderstood. And so these people are trying to justify themselves, their goodness, their righteousness, I mean, I mean if, you, if, you're, if, if, if that's kind of you this morning, if there's this thought, I, I, gotta, I gotta do this right and I gotta do that right and I gotta get right and you know, the, you know I get, okay, I got, okay, I got the wrong standard, I'll get the right standard and then I'll live up to that. If that's, if that's you, I mean, just think about standing before Jesus Christ and trying to explain to him who is sinless every word, deed, motivation, thought, intention of your heart. Just, just, just consider that for a moment. How will you do? None of us can pass that test. If your self is your savior, you've got the wrong savior. And so did these that Jesus was talking to. And so he wants to offer them a way out. He wants to tell them what they need to do. And this is where this, is where this passage gets really interesting. Because this is the point where we would tend to to be really easy with people, right? Okay, you're, gonna, you're ready to acknowledge that there's sin in your life. You're, you're ready to acknowledge that you fall short of the glory of God. It's wonderful. You're ready to do that. So what do we say? Just believe. And so we, we pass off to people this easy believism. Jesus didn't do that at all. Not in this passage and not in many other passages. <laughs> Look what he does. He gives them the brutality of selfless justification the brutality of selfless justification. Now, you say, well, what do you mean by selfless justification? Well, I mean this. Selfless justification means taking all the goodness that you think you have, 
that you're trying to work up to, all the things that you think would give you credit before God, take all of those, put them in a basket and throw them in the trash and acknowledge to God that you cannot meet the standard and put your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ who lived the perfect life for you so he could die the death to pay the penalty for your sins and you could be saved because of his righteousness, not yours. That is selfless justification. Very different from self-justification, right? And here's the deal. Here's what Jesus is trying to say. Selfless justification is brutal. It's hard. It's not easy. Look at it in verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. Difficult verse. Here's what I think Jesus is saying here. The Old Testament established a standard of perfection that you can't meet. The law and the prophets were from the beginning until John. And they established a principle of morality. They established a requirement on people that nobody can meet. But the good news is a solution is here and it's come. The ultimate solution wasn't there. There was a solution in the Old Testament and the sacrifices, but they only pointed forward to the solution that's now here. So the good news is, the gospel of the kingdom that's being preached is what? Jesus is here. The king is here. And he's paying the price, the entrance fee for those who will come into his kingdom that the law has always required and that the law still requires. But I can't meet the law, so what do I do? Trust in me. Give aside the self-justification that you're trying to do and turn to me for your salvation. Trust in me. The very thing that the Pharisees had no idea of doing. Jesus is saying, what you cannot do, I can do for you, but you're going to have to trust in me. And they're saying, no thanks. No thanks. Because you see, in order to come to faith in Christ, you have to rip away violently tear away your ego-driven efforts. Acknowledge that you are a sinner who can never meet the standard of God. And throw yourself in the mercy of Jesus. It's the only way, beloved. And people just simply won't do this. That's why Jesus says, you know, death to self is a bloody, brutal affair. It's bloody, you know what? It's bloody and brutal on everybody involved. The, the, Jesus has been depicting, the God has been depicting this from the beginning. Not only did you have the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, which did not take away sins, but pointed to the one who would take away sins so they had forgiveness on credit. Not only did you have that, you had the covenant sign of circumcision, which was what? A bloody, messy business that cut away at the very Life spring of a man, right? Making what point? You can't save yourself. There's a bloody process involved in salvation. It's brutal. It's brutal, first of all, on the Savior. It's brutal on the Savior. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to do what? To suffer and die. He's trying to tell that to his disciples time after time, and they are not getting it. Not understanding that that's what has to happen, but he's going to pay this, the penalty for the sins of all of those who will believe. That's where he's headed. Now, the physical pain of that experience will be unbelievable. We come to that passage of Scripture, we'll give you a little definition, but I won't give you very much because it's a brutal process to crucify somebody physically. But that, that is nothing compared to the spiritual suffering of the separation that Jesus is about to suffer from the Father that he loves on our behalf. Suffering the penalty for our sin. 
Now, let me ask you this question. Would the father have required this of the son if it were not necessary? Don't kid yourself, beloved. Their self-justification is not possible. The cross tells you that. God the Father and God the Son would have not conspired together before the beginning of time to bring about this method of redemption if there was any possibility that you or I or anybody else could self-justify. It wouldn't have happened. The cross proves the inability of ourselves to justify ourselves. An old liberal pastor, Henry Emerson Fosdick, Riverside Church. Some of you may have heard of him from the early days of the 20th century. He didn't buy that. He said this, he said that, you know, the idea that Jesus died for sin was pre-civilized barbarity. That's a pretty good description of our world, I think. He said that, quote, to assume that by any single high priestly act of self-sacrifice, Christ saved the world was a theological disgrace, end quote. But I must tell you something, that's what Henry Emerson Fosdick thought. It's not what the Bible teaches. So you have a choice. Do you wanna believe a guy like that and however many followers he's got these days, or do you wanna believe the Bible that God has revealed himself in? Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans 6.10, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. Is that not substitutionary atonement? The Bible says in Hebrews 10.10, 10, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's the one way of salvation. Self-justifying will never do it. Providing redemption was a brutal, bloody business because sin is a brutal, bloody business. We don't understand that. Our culture is in denial on so many levels that we have forgotten that it isn't just naughtiness. That our sin is a violation of the character of a holy, infinitely holy God. If you don't think sin is a bloody, I don't know how you really could live these days and not know this. The problem is we, we, we blame it all on somebody else. We look at ISIS and we can say, yes, yeah, man, sin is a bloody business for those guys. And it is. What we don't see is that the same spirit that motivates them lives within us. That we're just as capable of brutality as they are, just in different ways. We don't lob people's heads off. We lob their reputations off. We take issue, we criticize, we backbite, we talk behind people's backs. We do all these other things that are nothing different. Jesus says you hate your brother in your heart. It's just like you murdered him. Let's, let's be honest about who we are, beloved. We, there's no salvation until we get that. Salvation emerged from the most brutal of actions that you can imagine because it was covering something that is, it was a brutal violation of God himself. So salvation is brutal on the Savior, but secondly, it's brutal on those who are saved. It's brutal on the saved. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. It's given people a lot of problems. What does it mean they force their way into it? Some have felt that what that phrase means is Jesus is saying you're, by, by means of your self-justification, you're trying to force your way in and you can't get there. That is a possible interpretation, but I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. I believe firmly that what Jesus is saying is it is a hard process to deny self and come to faith in Christ. The cost to us is free. But the price of giving up my own ego and giving up my own self-justifying ways and trying to present myself as sufficient before God on my terms is very difficult to give up. But what does he say here? That the message of the gospel is what? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. That's the gospel. It's not good works, it's good news. 
the good news is that Jesus did for us what we could not do, but we must by faith now accept that. And in order to do that, we have to, we have to essentially condemn ourselves. We have to say, you are condemned. I throw myself on the mercy of God. Lord, be merciful to me as sinner, is what the guy in Luke 18 said, right? And Jesus said, that's the one that went away justified. Not the one that gave a list of his qualifications. He went away condemned. Repent. We must repent. You know, repentance is hard because a lot of people confuse repentance and remorse. It's one thing to feel bad about what you're doing. It's another thing to, from your heart of hearts, give yourself over to Jesus Christ to leave behind the sin. That has to be the intention of the heart. I was, I was a little boy when we had this revival meeting in our town. And uh, my dad and a friend of his were in charge of uh, the offering. So they would, they had a big team because you know, this was all held in a big convention center there. They had a big team of people who would usher and then they would come and bring the money in each night and it would be counted. And they had, they had a teenage boy who was helping out and one night somebody discovered he was, you know, he was helping himself to a little on the way to the counting room. And so they confronted him. And he began to cry and he told how sorry he was and it would never happen again. And he turned the money over to him that he had stolen and he continued to cry. And they talked about him, about the need for repentance and the need to confess your sins. And he said he surely had. And then at the end they said, would you please turn your pockets out? Here came us several more $20 bills, right? There was no, that was remorse for getting caught. It wasn't repentance by any stretch of the imagination. Repentance is the desire, is the intention, is the focus of the heart to leave the sin behind. And it's, the, it's really, Luther said, it's not just a matter of repenting once. I mean, it is. We come to a saving experience with Christ when our heart really turns to him. But Luther says, you know what? It's, 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 it, repentance is an ongoing, it's an ongoing event in the life of a Christian. As God reveals more and more who we are, our heart becomes more and more responsive to him. We desire to leave the sin behind and it shows that there's a true repentance going on. It's not these crocodile tears. I remember my dad said, that kid cried crocodile tears. I didn't know what crocodile tears were until then. They're tears of remorse, but not repentance. A lot of us have had that. To repent is to be sorry and turn away. That's what the word repentance means. It means literally to change one's mind, to turn away, to do a 180 degree turn away from sin and self and toward God. That's repentance, that's true repentance. And re Jesus' point here is true repentance is a shock to the system. It's devastatingly hard to accept that I'm unacceptable. If you don't think so, try and help someone come to faith in Christ. They will continually go back to what they're doing that God should accept. As though somehow we could put ourselves under obligation to God by anything we do. Remember how Jesus said it in Luke 9, 23, if anyone comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. That's the ongoing repentance that Luther was talking about. Take up his cross daily and follow me. It's now me, meaning Jesus, not me, meaning self. And that is hard. It's a hard place to come to. It's not the easy beliefism that many of us were raised with and have been taught. It's a, it's a, it's a momentary decision that leads to a life, life style change, change of a lifetime. It's a life-changing commitment to come to Christ, to come to faith in Christ, and true repentance is hard. That's why Jesus said in Luke, 9, Luke 13, verse 24, you may remember this, he said, strive to enter through the narrow door. He never once suggested this is gonna be easy. It's not. It's hard to leave self behind and follow Christ. During Billy Graham's crusade in Melbourne, Australia in 1959, one man wrote this letter to a Melbourne newspaper. 
He said, after hearing Dr. Billy Graham on the air, I am heartily sick of the type of religion that insists my soul and everyone else's needs saving. I have never felt that I was lost, nor do I feel that I daily wallow in the mire of sin, although repetitive preaching insists that I do. Give me a practical religion that teaches gentleness and tolerance, that acknowledges no barriers of color or creed, that remembers the aged and teaches children of goodness and not sin. If in order to save my soul I must repent, I prefer to remain forever damned. That's sad beyond description, is it not? How could you prefer to remain forever damned only because you don't believe that this is the way? But see, this is what Jesus is teaching. This is hard. But you must leave self behind. You must turn toward Jesus. He must become the Lord of your life. Unwilling to endure the brutality of repentance. Then thirdly, Jesus talks here about the basis for self-condemnation. And by that I mean he's trying to help us understand that we really are by ourselves condemned. And that our only hope is to throw ourselves on his mercy. This is what he's teaching, I think, in verses 17 and 18. He comes back to the law. And then he throws in, you know, this, what looks like it's a totally isolated comment about divorce. I mean, that verse on divorce in verse 18 just seems totally out of place. Why would it even be there? But he's making a point. Let me see if I can try and clarify you what he's trying to do. Look at verse 17 again. He says, but it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. He's back to the law. And what he's doing is he's saying, listen, you may do whatever you want with the law and you may interpret it however you want in order to make yourself look good. You may bend the rules and you may write your own little interpretations that you can keep and then say, what a good boy am I, I kept the law. But he said, I have news for you. Not one dot of that law is gonna go away. That law you're trying to avoid with your traditions and with your interpretations isn't gonna change just because you thought it should. The law is the law and the law stands. You can't get around it. You can't go past it. The law is what you will be judged by if you do not choose the mercy and grace that I offer you. The law is going nowhere. Heaven and earth will pass away before the law goes away. Okay, so you see the point he's making, right? He's establishing the point. The law is what you're up against. This statement of the character of God is what you're up against. And now what he does in verse 18 is he gives an example. He gives an example. He could have, he could have chosen a million different examples, but he chooses here divorce, and I'll explain it in a moment. Verse 18, he says, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman, divorced from her husband, commits adultery. What he's saying is this. Salvation comes from forcing your way in through repentance. To repent is to acknowledge the sin that's in your life and to cast yourself on the mercy of God. But if you won't do that, if you insist on self-justifying, then here's what you're up against. The law doesn't change just because you wrote it differently. The law stays what the law is. And you can't get around it because you have little rules that reinterpret it. And let me give you an example. You think you're not adulterers, but you are. Now, Jesus could have chosen, as I said, any one of a number of examples. He just happens to choose this one here. He could have even done something different with this one. He could have said like he did in Matthew 5, if you look after a woman to lust after her, you're an adulterer. Could have done that which is what he did in Matthew 5. This time he does something differently. He says, you guys are adulterers because you're just divorcing like right and left. But what you're really doing is committing adultery. You think you're getting around the law because it gives you the possibility of divorce and it did in Deuteronomy 24, but the law is gonna remain 
It's a, even though God gave this opportunity in Deuteronomy 24, it didn't mean that it wasn't a sin. It is. What you're doing is you're saying, we don't want to commit adultery. We'll not commit adultery outwardly, but we'll you know, leave our wife. We'll get married to another one. And Jesus is saying in that way, you're committing adultery. You're adulterers. Here's a quick background on this. God allowed for a man to divorce his wife in Deuteronomy 24, verse 2. And, and it says in verse 20, Deuteronomy 24, verse 2, it says you could, he could divorce his wife because he has found some indecency in her. Indecency or uncleanness. It's a, it's a little bit of a vague term. It isn't specifically defined. Now, having said that, Genesis 2, and you could go to Malachi, 4, uh, Malachi 2, make very clear that, the, that marriage is a covenant relationship. It's a covenant relationship not to be violated, not to be broken. It's a relationship that God has established. But he says, but Jesus says in Matthew 19 that God gave the exception in Deuteronomy 24 because of the hardness of men's hearts. Meaning, yeah, okay, I gave you the way and a process that you could divorce, but I didn't tell you it wasn't a sin. I didn't tell you it wasn't wrong. So by the time of Jesus, here's what had happened. There were basically two schools of thought around divorce. There was a rabbi named Shammai who taught his followers that divorce could be allowed for, the, for sexual unfaithfulness only if it were not to be sinful on the part of the person being divorced. Sexual unfaithfulness would be the only legitimate reason for divorce. And Jesus basically agrees with that. He's not trying to make a full teaching of divorce here in Luke chapter 16, verse 18. Are you with me? But he gives a, a little bit of a fuller explanation in Matthew 19 where he specifically asked about divorce. In Matthew 19, verse 9, he says this, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, porneia, fornication, any sexual relationship outside of marriage, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So Jesus seems to allow for it in that one possibility. But the vast majority, and Shammai is the, is the rabbi who was teaching this in those days. He had a very small following. Most of the people followed another rabbi whose name was Hillel, and Hillel taught this. Hillel taught that that reference to indecency or uncleanness in Deuteronomy 24 was big enough to drive a semi through. He taught that a husband could divorce his wife, quote, if she spoiled a dish of food, Tough standard, right? If she spun in the street, whatever that means, if she, I, th I think it means made herself conspicuous, if she talked to a strange man, all men are strange, you couldn't get, <laughs> couldn't get past that one. If she was guilty of speaking disrespectfully of her husband's relations in his hearing, if she was a brawling woman, you could, you could drive anything through that hole, right? There was another rabbi named Akiba who came along and he said, hey, if the husband thinks another woman is prettier and he wants her, it's okay. That's a rabbi. That was kind of the things that were on the table. So the Jews, the rabbis, the Pharisees in particular, who disdained adultery, who thought adultery was the worst thing going, justified divorce and remarriage for the most flimsy reasons you can think of, thinking that they were fine, looking only to the outward appearance, but were actually violating God's rules in the meantime. That's what Jesus is getting at here. You guys think you're clean? Not even close. You are, by the way you are treating your wives and by the way you are having divorce, you are committing Adultery. Your traditions notwithstanding, God's law stands by his law. You are adulterers. One of the million ways that you violate his character by your misinterpretations. That's what Jesus is teaching. Now let me be very quick here to talk to those of you who may be divorced, of whom I am one. Jesus is not teaching that divorce is somehow an unpardonable sin. He's just letting us know that there are rare exceptions where divorce might be, you might even be, 
able to have a divorce, initiate a divorce, and not be sinning. My experience, when there's divorce, there's almost always plenty of sin on both sides. But even if you could justify that there was unfaithfulness, and this person, or this person doesn't want to leave you because Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 basically expands what the Lord says here, and he says it's, it's by a word of the Lord that he expands it to say if you've, if you've been absolutely abandoned, divorce could be possible without sin, but in most cases, it's, it's going to be sinful. But it's, beloved, what do you do with sin? You confess it. You repent of it. You turn your back on that which is wrong. And you allow the Lord to forgive you and to cleanse you. And divorce is no unique sin that can't be forgiven. It's just that in the church, we've made it so easy that we don't think of anything in terms of very, being very sinful anymore. We don't help people confess what's wrong because we don't teach them what's wrong. Jesus did. Here's what Jesus' whole intention is here. This is the conclusion, so just listen carefully. Jesus' whole intention is to tear down the masterpieces that people make of their own lives, thinking that they are going to present this to God, to tear them down. It doesn't matter whether it's adultery by, by divorce or whether it's adultery by the thought life of the person. It doesn't matter whether it's murder outwardly or murder of the heart by which we hate people. It doesn't matter whether it's selfishness. It doesn't matter what the sin Jesus wants to tear away in all of us the facade that we put up that says, I'm a good person, and say, yes, you're a good person who is a sinner and condemned by God. And your only hope is to come to him in mercy. Do not self-justify. In, uh, in his book, Lectures to My Students, which is a fantastic book for guys that are going in the ministry, <laughs> and even for those who are not, uh, Charles Spurgeon gave this illustration. He talked about a, a man named Sir James Thornhill who, was, who, built, who painted the cupola for St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And he told the story about how one time he was, he was up there, he was painting on the scaffolding, was up there, you know, hundreds of feet in the air, and he was painting away, and he stepped back so he could see it, and he kept stepping back a little further. And as, as he got back further, he was getting close to the edge of the scaffolding, and he, and he wasn't noticing it. And someone else who was up there with him one of his helpers noticed what was happening. So he quickly picked up a brush and he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he dabbed it onto the painting and basically ruined that part of the painting. And of course, Sir, Sir James came running forward and said, what are you doing? And the guy said, well, you were, you were almost at the edge. Another few seconds and you were gonna back off the edge. And he said, I knew if I, if I, if I hollered at you, you'd look down and you would fall for sure, but I ruined your masterpiece so that I could save your life. God wants to do, beloved. He wants to ruin the masterpiece of our own facade, of our own, what we think we've built up that we can present to God. He wants to ruin that so that now we will throw ourselves on his mercy. That's the message. Ruined masterpieces are a good thing when they lead us to come to him. Jesus' message to these Pharisees. He's trying to ruin the masterpiece of their own creation so that he can make them his own masterpiece. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for the word. It's so telling, so convicting. We acknowledge that we have this great tendency to self-justify. Lord, even as, even as believers, we continually think, how can I present myself to God? And we're already in the family. We're already perfect in your eyes. Now it's just, you just want us to live up to that, to the name. Help us to do that because we love you, not because there's some duty associated with this. Help us to get the gospel. Pray for anyone here this morning whose heart is opening because they've never really understood that you can't self-justify that the justification only comes by faith in Jesus Christ and the finished work that he did, which means not only his death, but his life on our behalf, fulfilling the law that we could never fulfill so that his righteousness could be given to us, credited to us, if we come to him in faith. Help us to do that, Lord, for 
for our own sake, but even more for your sake. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand, please, as we sing together.